Hello, everyone. Uh, it's 30 minutes after the hour. We'll just give it um, a minute or so, as we are expecting a few more participants now, and it is clocking up. Uh, but we'll get going in, in a few seconds. Well, we've still got a few people joining, but I think we'll make a start as we've got four presentations and hopefully a, a good uh, Q&A session to, to get through this afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to everyone for joining this webinar and welcome. Uh, the Clean Arctic Alliance's webinar this today uh, is called Switching Fuel, How to Cut Black Carbon Emissions from Arctic Shipping. Just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. First of all, um, it should be up on the slide, but could you just please note that we will be recording the webinar and making it available afterwards. And secondly, if you have any questions, could you please indicate to which speaker your question is directed and submit it via the Zoom Q&A option, which should be near the bottom of your screen. We'll endeavour during the Q&A session at the end to answer all of the questions, but if time runs out, we will endeavour to follow up with a response after the event. I'm going to start off uh, just by providing a short background to the webinar. 11 years ago, Norway, Sweden and the United States submitted a paper, Reductions of Emissions of Black Carbon from Shipping in the Arctic to the International Maritime Organization's Marine Environment Protection Committee, a meeting which took place 11 years ago this week. This paper acknowledged that black carbon emissions, especially when deposited on land and sea ice, are a significant contributor to warming and melting. It also acknowledged that reductions in black carbon now can provide short-term climate responses that are absolutely necessary to forestall a climate tipping point, thereby providing the climate breathing time for the needed reductions in carbon dioxide to take hold over the longer term. And the reductions of black carbon will also have positive effects on human health. The paper also noted that the total warming effect of global black carbon emissions was estimated at between 22% and 61% that of annual carbon dioxide emissions, and that over short time periods, the impact of black carbon is especially severe. It was estimated that it causes 680 times more warming than the same amount of carbon dioxide over a 100 year period, and 2,200 times over a 20 year period. The paper concluded that by saying, because shipping traffic is expected to grow substantially as melting opens up sea lanes, the IMO should consider actions to respond to these impacts. And this week, 11 years later to the week, the International Maritime Organization's Pollution Prevention and Response Subcommittee meeting will continue to consider what actions should be taken. The Arctic is experiencing historic changes. Last year in June, temperatures north of the Arctic Circle reached 38 degrees Celsius, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the highest temperature ever recorded in the Arctic. The northern sea route along Russia's Arctic coast opened in July for the first time ever. And in the autumn, the reformation of sea ice was delayed and we've seen shipping movements throughout the winter months. Today's webinar addresses Arctic climate impacts of in-Arctic black carbon sources. 
the consequences for local communities and black carbon emission control options. It addresses questions. Can a fuel switch reduce black carbon emissions? And what can be done to reduce black carbon emissions from shipping? It's hoped that today's webinar will contribute to the discussions that will take place at the IMO subcommittee meeting this week. In fact, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, I was going to say, but it depends where you are in the world. Speakers, we have four guest speakers today, and then we will come to the Q&A session. We'll move straight from one speaker to the next with a brief introduction to each. However, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar, but we won't be answering in the, them until we get to the final session. Our first speaker today will be Pam Pearson. Pam is the co-chair of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Agricultural Initiative and director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Over to you, Pam. Just checking that you can see um, my slides. Yes. Okay, and so I'm going to be speaking about the climate impacts of black carbon. I do want to emphasize, however, that there are health impacts as well, especially on Arctic communities, and uh, that will be addressed in the subsequent uh, presentation. I thought it would be important to talk about what black carbon is for those who are new to this. It arises from incomplete combustion. These are extremely small dark particles. They're smaller actually than PM 2.5, which most countries, especially OECD nations focus on regulating. They're very lightweight. So if they're lofted into the high atmosphere for wildfires, for example, they can travel great distances, but most often black carbon is a local pollutant and a local climate impact. And that's very important when it comes to Arctic shipping. It deposits very close to its source. It generally warms when it's airborne, but the most intense warming occurs when it's over reflective surfaces such as snow and ice. And so that really is the most intense impact. And this gives you a sense of how subtle this impact can be. This is actually from Svalbard. You have polluted snow that has been thrown up by a snowmobile track and it's almost difficult, almost impossible to see it. Um, even when you put something white next to it. But it's a very, very powerful impact, again, uh, when occurring locally. And this is what you see here in terms of the impact of black carbon globally, where it's still definitely measurable, but primarily from atmospheric warming. And then if you look to the right, the Arctic average, because of this enhanced impact of black carbon on snow and ice, it suddenly really bumps up the impact in the Arctic itself. Um, and increased shipping is going to bring more warming from actually ozone as well as black carbon in the Arctic. Um, so I want you to focus primarily on the potential black carbon increase on the right, because you can see how closely that follows shipping lanes. And it's because of this localized impact. I do want to mention, however, that um, ozone precursors are formed by shipping as well. And there's a more generalized impact from that also. So it's probably not too much of an exaggeration then to say that within Arctic shipping is likely the single most effective delivery system for black carbon impacts on Arctic sea ice, uh, on Arctic land ice, on the Arctic climate, and therefore globally. It's a tremendously important source. And uh, temperature in the Arctic is of course going up. Sean referred to this. This is July and August of this past summer. And uh, sea ice has been going down really almost since it's been measured, but definitely since uh, 1991 by the satellite record. And we're essentially losing Arctic sea ice. And there are a lot of feedbacks associated with that. Uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, northern seas are getting freshening. They're eutrophying. In other words, lower oxygen. That can lead to fisheries collapse. 
uh, the slowing of the ocean current, which is extremely important, uh, mid-latitude disturbances in weather patterns, permafrost thaw and emissions, and of course, sea level rise from the Greenland ice sheet and Arctic glaciers. Um, so there are a number of organizations that are working on uh, Arctic black carbon, both scientifically and policy-wise. Two expert groups within the Arctic Council, the LERTAP Convention is focused on black carbon as a constituent of PM 2.5, and also the Climate and Air Coalition or UN Environment in its transport initiative with um, Brian, who will be speaking last today, the lead on shipping. So I'll turn it then over and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pam. We'll move on to our second speaker then. Our second speaker is Austin Amasuk. Austin is an advocate with Kerouac Inc. Inc.'s marine program. He is based in Nome, Alaska. Austin, you have the floor. Uh, good morning from Sikazok, uh, also known as Nome in Western Alaska on the shores of the Bering Sea. My name is Austin Amasuk. I work for a tribal organization, Coerc, uh, which you can access and learn more about at our website, coerc.org. Folks uh, in my region, uh, we consider uh, shipping and climate change uh, one of the greater risks to Arctic Indigenous people, uh, Arctic, Indigenous, Arctic, Arctic Indigenous communities, and of course, uh, Arctic ecosystems. Uh, and for a little perspective, uh, this photo, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a real time, a current photo of what it looks like uh, in my region now. Uh, this year we have uh, relatively abundant uh, ice. Uh, however, uh, scenes uh, like this uh, for an Arctic indigenous person like myself who accesses uh, the ice uh, for hunting, uh, these kinds of uh, healthy uh, sea ice uh, scenes and photos are becoming rarer and rarer. And so we're quite convinced that uh, increased shipping uh, and climate change are gonna impact us to a considerable degree. We have already felt the impacts uh, from climate change. Uh, we've already felt the impacts uh, from increased shipping. Uh, in the last several years, uh, there have been massive uh, seabird uh, or productivity declines, uh, seabird uh, productivity impacts. Uh, we have already felt and we have already measured uh, declines in marine mammal populations. Uh, the, U the U.S. is now considering a critical habitat for two ice seal species for the Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea. Uh, we've experienced uh, wild uh, fluctuations in salmon returns. Uh, and of course, the the warming uh, has caused uh, a, a massive change in vegetation uh, in the Arctic, and uh, we're all very concerned for th for these for these impacts. Um, so, uh, what does the uh, sea ice uh, look like uh, for this year? Um, this is uh, from the National Weather Service uh, their ice page. Uh, the red areas uh, show areas of 100% ice coverage. The lighter shaded areas uh, show uh, ice coverage less than 100%. And then the gray areas show the shore fast ice regions. And if you look at this uh, graphic, uh, you might uh, consider uh, sea ice to be plentiful. And uh, I suppose uh, from the two dimensional perspective, uh, it is, but from the three dimensional perspective, uh, it is not. Uh, sea ice is considerably thinner than it once was and though it may extend uh, in, in a two-dimensional aspect, uh, it's much thinner. It's susceptible to uh, rapid, uh, rapid melt-off. It's, uh, of course, uh, susceptible to the impacts from black carbon, which black carbon, which can accelerate melt-out. And that's in, that is, in fact, uh, what we've been experiencing uh, in my home uh, in the Arctic: a very rapid uh, spring melt, a very rapid uh, spring thaw. And so we're, of course, uh, uh, quite concerned what this has uh, for Arctic communities. Uh, for a long time, um, cold, uh, Arctic cold, uh, and sea ice have been um, have been the primary uh, uh, primarily influences for the tremendous productivity in the Arctic. Uh, 
our cold and our ice are essentially the reasons why our waters are so rich, but uh, lately have, uh, of course, uh, suffered uh, some, some, uh, you know, uh, some, some setbacks. Uh, hunters like myself, uh, we in fact are considering and talking about um, uh, localized, perhaps uh, extinctions uh, of some marine mammals. Uh, we are, of course, experiencing dramatic, dramatic declines uh, in uh, food sources, animal, uh, fish and wildlife sources that are at the bottom of the food rib that are, that are the uh, primary reasons why we have such high productivity in the Arctic that is, being, that is now being impacted by warming. We of course have black carbon uh, in the Arctic and we of course have uh, black carbon uh, in my community. Uh, this is a, a picture that I took uh, a couple years ago, June, uh, 2019. Uh, this is a photo looking south uh, from my community, uh, from our shallow deep draft port. Uh, on the horizon is a, uh, a tanker, uh, an example of the kind of tankers that uh, linger uh, in our region for up to four months during the ice-free season. And uh, if you look uh, closely, you can see uh, the uh, stack emissions uh, from, from that vessel. Uh, that oil tanker trailing off to the west here, off the screen actually. I, I tracked those emissions for 11 miles uh, west of Nome. And um, I reported uh, those visual violations to our, our state uh, air quality managers as well as our federal air quality managers. But unfortunately, because, because we lack enforcement in rural Alaska, uh, things like uh, stack emissions, uh, soot emissions, uh, black carbon em that carbon emissions uh, go on unchecked, uh, essentially unregulated, because there's no, essentially no enforcement, no state enforcement, no federal enforcement, and no local enforcement uh, in rural Alaska to control and combat these uh, carbon emissions. I, uh, uh, that's my last slide here. I wanted to be brief and preserve time for a discussion, but I, I, uh, I uh, understand uh, that black carbon can uh, live uh, in the atmosphere for up to up to two weeks, and so I wanted to know uh, of the tankers that are uh, lingering in our area, uh, is it possible for black carbon emissions from our from our town or from ships that are lingering in our area? Is it possible that they could uh, be deposited in, in the polar ice cap? Uh, and so, Nome at the bottom of this screen there is some 520 miles from the nearest uh, polar ice. Uh, this is a photo from NASA's website taken June 2019. Um, so uh, you know, assuming that black carbon can live in the atmosphere up for up to two weeks, uh, is it possible for black carbon from our area to travel to the polar ice cap region? And uh, I looked at weather um, for Western Alaska, uh, Northwestern Alaska and the North Slope, and it, it appears that uh, the average uh, wind speeds uh, for that time period are some four to four and a half miles an hour. And th at those wind speeds, uh, black carbon from our area could reach the polar ice cap in as little as four to four and a half days. So it does seem possible that, uh, it certainly is possible and uh, reasonable to think that black carbon emissions uh, in the Arctic uh, impact the Arctic, particularly as uh, we uh, attain more daylight uh, and that daylight having impact on the albedo. So. Black carbon, of course, is global in nature, and there are many aspects uh, that need to be managed in order to combat this uh, threat to the climate. But if the IMO can take action to limit black carbon from, from ships, uh, because of the small time frame that we're talking about, the black carbon, how long it lives in the atmosphere, it's reasonable to think that if the IMO takes action now, that it could impact and save some time for the Arctic to develop better technologies to get a handle on greenhouse gas emissions, be good stewards of the earth, be good stewards of the globe, um, uh, you know, protect Arctic indigenous people, Arctic indigenous communities and Arctic ecosystems from the impact of, of melting. And so, thank you. Thank you, Austin. We'll move straight on with our next presentation uh, our third presentation is from Pavi Akko Saxa, who is from VTT, the Technical Research Center of Finland. Pavi, over to you. Good afternoon, 
Uh, hope you seen, see now the presentation. So I am Päiti Akko Saksa from VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. And I'm going to talk to you about the research uh, results from uh, projects on the black carbon emissions from uh, shipping and uh, particularly the control options that can reduce black carbon emissions. And uh, there has been a number of uh, projects on black carbon emissions from marine engines over the past years. And uh, these are based on the uh, on the IMO call on the on these voluntary projects and several projects have been carried out in the USA, Canada, Japan, Germany, Finland. And uh, this means that uh, we know now a lot more of the black carbon emissions from marine engines than uh, around five years ago. And I'm going to present some of the main findings over the recent years. It seems that I can't uh, move, move this slide. Now, okay, so this first slide shows that um, the black carbon emissions vary a lot from ship to ship and from engine to engine. So um, Brian Comer um, from ICCT made an inventory uh, based on the 2015 data and in that inventory the black carbon emissions emission factor from marine engines was uh, 250 milligrams per kilogram of fuel and actually before that the emission factors were much higher. Uh, then uh, in the recent uh, projects on the black carbon emissions from shipping we noticed that uh, the black carbon emissions from modern engines are much lower already. So uh, even 80% reduction has been seen when compared to the older uh, marine engines, diesel engines. Uh, this is a, a development of the electronic injection systems, etc. But then even lower emissions can be achieved uh, uh, achieved uh, with uh, when moving on clean fuels, LNG, and, and when using uh, like diesel particulate filters combined with distillate fuels or then el electrostatic precipitator technology. Uh, these uh, cleanest technologies are not yet widely used and especially the diesel particulate filters they are still in the validation and piloting phase because the uh, quality, quality of uh, marine fuels is very challenging. And uh, the particulate filter technology, for example, requires uh, fuel that uh, they are typically de developed for fuel that contains less than 0.1% sulfur content. So it is uh, one of the, of the cleaner marine fuels. And then uh, the figure on the right hand side uh, shows that uh, when we look at the individual uh, engines and not the inventories, the inventories are averaging a huge amount of data. But when we look at the uh, individual uh, marine engines, the concentrations of black carbon in, in the exhaust gas, they vary by a factor of 10,000 and even more. So there is a lot of uh, uh, room, many orders of magnitudes, differences between, between engines, old engine, modern engines, and then these ones that use also clean technologies like clean fuels or after treatment devices. And uh, there is a lot to do lot of potential to reduce black carbon emissions from shipping. Uh, 
This is uh, one of the summaries that have been produced over the past years uh, for the IMO. So this is uh, document 672. And um, it's based uh, on the data and evaluations that were available in 2018. And even after this, uh, a lot more uh, information has been gathered. And uh, the green bars uh, indicate that the data was sufficient, or we think that we have sufficient data to make conclusions, and the gray ones uh, are based on very limited data on and on the systems that are not considered as uh, on-market systems. So they are piloted, validated, or demonstrated. And when we look at the uh, green bars, we um, can see that uh, some technologies uh, give only moderate black carbon reduction, um, while some are very efficient, especially the oils and fats, biodiesel and LNG from the data that was available proved to be uh, quite constantly efficient in different studies, whereas uh, distillate fuel use uh, had a, a very high spread from high reduction to some maybe close to 30% reduction in black carbon emissions. But that depends on the marine engine where, where this fuel is used and uh, that uh, is related to adjustments and how, how this uh, uh, engine is built and so on. Is it old or modern one and so on. And uh, then some uh, comments on the recent progress uh, over the, um, in uh, 2020, uh, global sulfur limit redu was reduced to 0.5%. And here it is noted that we know very little today of the quality of this fuel, especially as con concerns such uh, properties like uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons or heavy metals that are in the fuel. So we are in a, in, in a way in a new situation today. And then uh, we already mentioned these, uh, these uh, efficient technologies to reduce black carbon emissions. And then we have also some emerging technologies which are in the research and development phase. And those are shown here uh, as the most effi efficient technologies. So hydrogen and full electric, of course, don't produce any black carbon emissions. And then the uh, technologies that were mentioned uh, already are here uh, rated by their efficiency. Then. Uh, a few additional com uh, comments on the technologies can, that can reduce black carbon emissions to, to summarize and add on a couple of things. So we have these cleaner fuels uh, and after treatment technologies and modern engines. Optimal engine loads is quite important issue. Uh, we don't know yet how, how important it is uh, for modern engine maybe not as important as for old engines, but especially in the Arctic, where the low engine loads uh, are quite typical uh, due to the uh, conditions. Um, there might be attention deserved in this aspect. And then hybridization, hydrogen battery shore power can be used also. Uh, but then one more comment uh, concerns uh, the role of some uh, sectors that have not been evaluated yet very much. So what is the role of small vessels and boats or then um, auxiliary engines or boiler, boilers of uh, container ships and so on? How much black carbon they emit and what could be done to reduce black carbon emissions from those uh, sources? So to uh, end my presentation, uh, the 
maybe the main outcome is that uh, black carbon emissions uh, from different marine engines vary substantially and there are many technologies available to reduce uh, environmental and climate burden of shipping in the form of black carbon and uh, and some of these technologies are in piloting phase, but very promising also. So thank you. Thank you, Pavey. Right, we'll move straight on into our final speaker today, and that's Dr. Brian Comer, who is the lead for the International Council on Clean Transportation's Marine Programme. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sean. And you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, thanks for the clean art to the Clean Arctic Alliance for inviting me to present on our work. Today I'll discuss the expected black carbon emissions reductions from fuel switching. I'll begin by explaining recent trends in black carbon emissions from ships, and then I'll describe the emissions reduction potential of switching from residual fuels like HFO to distillates. I'll explain why switching to distillates rather than using very low sulfur fuel oil is required for an effective black carbon control policy. And I'll finish by explaining the additional benefits of switching to distillates and end with some conclusions. Ships emitted more than 350 tons of black carbon in the Arctic in 2019, according to our research, as you can see on the map here. And black carbon emissions have increased in recent years. The left panel on this graph shows how much black carbon was emitted in the Arctic from HFO fueled ships. And it shows a 72% increase between 2015 and 2019. The middle panel shows black carbon emitted from all fuels this is HFO, distillate, and LNG combined. And it shows that total black carbon emissions in the IMO's definition of, of the Arctic grew 85% between 2015 and 2019. Compare that to the global increase in black carbon emissions from ships, which was 8%. This means that black carbon emissions from ships increased 10 times faster in the Arctic than the rest of the world. One immediate way to reduce black carbon emissions is for ships that use residual fuels like HFO to switch to distillates. This slide shows the black carbon emission factors used in the fourth IMO greenhouse gas study. The red line shows emissions from residual fuels and the gray line shows emissions from distillate fuels. Black carbon emissions are about 80% lower for the two-stroke engines when they use distillates and 40 to 50% lower for four-stroke engines, depending on the engine load. In the Arctic, HFO is mainly used by four-stroke engines, although more than a quarter of HFO use is by two strokes. Based on this, we should expect that switching from HFO to distillates in the Arctic will reduce black carbon emissions from HFO fuel ships by at least 40%. And that's what we found. According to our research, Although more than one quarter of HFO use is by two stroke, uh, pardon me. Uh, according to our research that takes into account fuel type, engine type and engine load, if HFO fueled ships switch to distillate, their black carbon emissions would be reduced by 44%. And because some ships in the Arctic are already using distillates, switching the HFO fueled fleet to distillates reduces total black carbon emissions by ships in the Arctic by 30%. The ICCT has convened six international technical workshops on black carbon between 2014 and 2019, focused on defining, measuring, and controlling black carbon emissions from ships. The workshops included about 30 participants each year, including researchers, scientists, engine manufacturers, IMO delegates, and regulators. At our sixth workshop, which was held in 2019 in Helsinki, participants identified six appropriate black carbon control policies, including black carbon emissions limits for ships globally and in the Arctic, a requirement to use newer, lower emitting ships in the Arctic, uh, 
a requirement to use shore power at port, but also a ban on using heavy fuel oil with a switch to distillates or other cleaner fuels, which you see in bold. You may be wondering where VLSFO fits. And this slide is an excerpt from the sixth workshop summary document. The workshop participants made it clear that to be effective as a black carbon control policy, a switch to distillates must also prohibit VLSFOs. And I've underlined the relevant um, text in red. This is because VLSFOs tend to have higher aromatic content and also lower hydrogen content than distillate fuels. And the general trend is that the higher the aromatic content and the lower the uh, hydrogen content, the higher the black carbon emissions. So for a fuel switch policy to be effective at reducing black carbon emissions, the participants agreed that VLSFOs should not be used and instead the switch should be made specifically to distillate fuels um, or other cleaner fuels. And of course, there are additional benefits of switching to distillates. The first is that using distillates reduces air pollution, including sulfur oxides and particulate matter. Second, distillates allow for the possibility of using exhaust gas after treatment technologies, such as diesel particulate filters and electrostatic precipitators, both of which reduce black carbon emissions by more than 90%. And lastly, using distillates eliminates the risk of an HFO spill and it lowers the potential spill costs. Some of our earlier research estimated that distillate spills are 30% less costly than VLSFO spills and 70% less costly than the high sulfur HFO. To conclude, black carbon emissions from ships are growing globally and even more rapidly, 10 times faster in the Arctic. ICCT workshop participants identified six appropriate black carbon control policies, including switching from HFO to distillates or other cleaner fuels, which does not include VLSFOs. Switching from HFO to distillates would immediately reduce black carbon emissions from ships and black carbon emissions from the HFO fueled fleet would fall 44%, reducing Arctic wide shipping emissions of black carbon by 30%. And switching to distillates has the added benefits of lowering air pollution, enabling the use of exhaust after treatment and lowering potential spill costs compared to VLSFO and HFO. I wanna thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions and I'll turn it back to you, Sean. Thank you, Brian. Thank you uh, to all of our speakers. Um, we now have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, we also have some additional panelists that we can bring in if, if uh, there are questions that the panel can't answer. Um, can I just remind everyone, please, to send any questions via the Q&A option and, if possible, to indicate who uh, the question is directed to. And to just get us started, I'm going to ask Pam um, to just throw up a slide and just explain again why it's important that we address black carbon from shipping in the Arctic. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And um, if you noticed during my presentation, I scrolled back and forth a bit. It was that for some reason, this slide was not showing. And um, if it can be made larger, that would be great, Sylvette. But on the left is the modeled impact of shipping, black carbon shipping, uh, globally and the climate impact on the Arctic. And of course, the amount of black carbon from outside our Arctic black shipping is very much greater than the amount of black carbon emitted from shipping within the Arctic. And to the right, you see the climate impact then of the within Arctic black carbon in comparison. And this is why I was emphasizing that black carbon really does need to be thought of as a local and regional pollutant and climate forcer because the climate impact uh, from atmospheric forcing, of course, is much greater in the Arctic. But the forcing, in other words, the climate impact, the warming from the deposited black carbon 
is very many times greater. And that's why it is so important at a time when we are losing so much Arctic sea ice, as well as watching accelerated uh, loss of ice on Greenland and accelerating thaw of permafrost in the Arctic, why it is so important to decrease or control in some manner the amount of black carbon from shipping within the Arctic itself, because the climate impact really is extremely great. Um, the other thing I'll say in connection with this is those estimates of black carbon are lower because this was a modeling effort uh, 10 years ago now, much lower than what we're actually observing today. It was thought that it was going to be a very gradual increase over time, but we've lost far more Arctic sea ice. And uh, the Arctic sea ice has also accelerated. Uh, and as a result, the amount of shipping and the amount of black carbon from within Arctic shipping is far greater than anyone thought it could ever be in 2011, as you can see from Brian's slides. So um, with that, it, it might help to sort of kick off this, this discussion of why within Arctic black carbon from shipping is so important. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions coming up now. Um, we'll start at the beginning. Brian, are you able to take the first question from Chris LaRue? It's a long question. I'm happy to, to just read it out so that everybody can uh, understand the question that's being answered. Chris asks, stating that a switch from HFO to distillate reduces black carbon, uh, that it reduces black carbon is a generalization. The specific fuel property, as you point out, is the fuel's aromatic content. Today's very low sulfur fuel oils have been shown to have reduced aromatic content with an in case, with an increase in paraffin, paraffinic content. Wouldn't it be better to simply put an aromatic content limit on fuel in the Arctic? And how does the aromatic content of VLSFO compare to marine distillate fuels? I'm sure, happy to take uh, a start at that. Um, I'm wondering if Pivey knows more about the relative aromatic content between a distillate fuel and, uh, and VLSFOs, um, but I can, I can start. So, um, on the fuel quality, um, on an, an aromatic limit, for instance, at the last ICCT black carbon workshop in 2019 in Helsinki, um, that was brought up as a potential black carbon control policy. And it was one that the workshop participants identified as needing more work. And so it could definitely be a way um, forward, but as you know, at IMO, um, making a new regulation uh, takes a long time. And we've already been working on this work plan since 2011 um, officially at IMO. And so um, the black carbon emission factors in the fourth greenhouse gas study are based on a review of the uh, actual measurements and, um, and test results that have been submitted to IMO, uh, mainly through PPR meetings. And so you can see that there's a, a general trend towards lower black carbon emissions when you uh, switch from a residual fuel to a, uh, to a distillate fuel. So we expect that there is a, a black carbon emissions reduction benefit of a general policy of switching from residual fuels to distillate fuels. And that's something that we can do immediately. So it's a step that can um, reduce black carbon emissions in the short term while we work on uh, additional black carbon control policies. One might be a fuel quality standard. Um, what would be uh, also could be appropriate is a black carbon emissions limit um, as I presented. And that is something that requires black carbon to be measured. And so it could be co-developed with the black carbon standardized measurement, black carbon, standardized black carbon measurement protocol, I should say. Uh, yeah, there's, there's some, some extra questions that I can go back to, but let me turn it back to Sean, um, but just by saying that on the aromatic content, um, in general, my understanding based on what I've read about VLSFOs and what I've um, seen from IBIA, including at their convention, uh, generally the distillate fuels have lower aromatic content than the VLSFOs. And so you would expect their black carbon emissions to be 
lower, but um, I'm wondering if Pavey or, or someone else has additional comments on that. Pavey, would you like to jump in on that question? Okay, thank you. So unfortunately, I think I don't have uh, much more information as we, as we don't have uh, many analysis results uh, of the very low sulfur fuel oil uh, that uh, was introduced. Um, so the surveys uh, that have been conducted, uh, they don't typically uh, report aromatic contents. And uh, even if they do, uh, we have still limited information and uh, comparison also to uh, aromatic content of uh, distillates uh, is something that, uh, that uh, unfortunately I can't, I don't have uh, sufficient da data on that aspect. Uh, but uh, I could uh, point out one um, issue that aromatic content is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to regulate uh, and uh, actually also in the road transport side, um, the, the aromatic limit is relatively high for gasoline and for diesel fuel. There isn't a limit, limit for total aromatic content. There are limits for benzene for, of gasoline and then polyaromatic content of diesel fuel. But uh, even in this respect, it would be quite, uh, quite uh, um, challenging to limit aromatic content of of uh, marine fuel. Thanks. Thank you, Pavey. Um, Chris has made some follow up points. I can't see actual questions in there, but what I'm going to do is go to another question and uh, give Pavey and Brian a chance to to read those comments and see if there's anything they want to add in a moment. But first of all, perhaps we could go to the question from Alexander, Alexander Klementiev, um, which says that well to wheel principle is being used uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. How about uh, making use of the same approach to estimate black carbon, the impact of black carbon and, and, and solutions? Brian? Yeah, I can, I can start and maybe Pam has something to say about the where black carbon is emitted um, and its impacts. Um, so yeah, I agree. The, the well to wheel principle, um, ICCT supports a well to wake principle for, for ships. And um, we actually have done some research on this. Um, we'll soon be publishing a briefing paper on uh, how to incorporate shipping into the EU ETS um, system on a well to uh, sorry, yeah, well to wake basis in a way that incorporates black carbon emissions downstream. Um, upstream black carbon emissions are not um, well quantified. I, we don't have good data on that. But um, I think the point would be that if the feedstock is the same, then the upstream emissions should be the same. So um, marine fuels are all made from, the fuels that we're talking about at least are made from crude oil we should expect the same upstream black carbon emission factors from them. So the difference would be downstream um, in the actual black carbon emitted from the ship itself. And we're finding from the research that's been presented to IMO and as reflected in the black carbon emission factors that are in the fourth greenhouse gas study, that the um, downstream black carbon emissions from using the distillate fuels are lower. And because black carbon has such a strong um, and high global warming potential, that that can actually make a difference on the well to, well to wake uh, emissions. So those higher black carbon emissions from burning the residual fuels um, are actually what can tip the well to wake emissions um, higher from the residual fuels compared to the distillate fuels. Thank you, Brian. Pam, did you want to add? Thank you. Well, I'd simply add that for um, black carbon and fuels, um, and this is often forgotten actually in those who are, who are focused on, on black carbon, uh, in many ways we work primarily on greenhouse gas emissions at this point. And so if one adds in, of course, uh, from a well to wheel perspective, the total climate impact, not just from black carbon, 
but also from the production process, then the, uh, the impact goes up even further because then you have global impacts um, from whatever other substances are um, emitted during that process. And then on top of that, the within Arctic black carbon. And that would probably tip the, um, the sign, if you like, uh, even in places where the scientific community is a bit less certain about black carbon impacts. Uh, in other words, outside the Arctic, outside cryosphere, snow and ice regions to something that would uh, be a, a, you know, a warming impact regardless. Thanks. Sorry, thank you. Um, a question's come in on the chat rather than the Q&A, so I will just read it out. Um, as I appreciate not everyone can see the chat or not necessarily see all the chat. Um, Thank you for the excellent presentations. It appears to me that there are many gains from switching to distillates or even other cleaner fuels. What are the main reasons not to switch? Brian, would you like to, or Pavey, either of you like to, to pick up on that? Oh, main, main reasons not to switch. Sorry. Any? Sorry, Sean, I, I don't understand the question. Sorry, I'll read it slowly again. It, it appears to me that there are many gains from switching to distillates or other cleaner fuels. What are the main reasons not to switch? I assume one of them oh, might I, be a I cost, uh, yeah. a, a question of the costs, but but other 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 factors? And I understand the cost issue is, is not the issue it used to be, certainly. Yeah, I, I can start on that. Um, so the, the fuel choice before 2020 used to be heavy fuel oil, uh, high sulfur heavy fuel oil, or marine gas oil. And marine gas oil was, in general, over the last several years, 50% more expensive than uh, the marine gas oil. And now after 2020, we have um, very low sulfur fuel oil as what's the, the main global fuel to meet the 0.5% sulfur limit. And that, um, those fuels are um, more expensive than the high sulfur heavy fuel oil and closer in price to marine gas oil. I think this morning it was about 12% more expensive to use marine gas oil than VLSFOs globally. Um, and that changes, but you know, there's the spread isn't as as dramatic um, as it used to be, and fuel costs are one component of the overall voyage costs, and so you have to take into account things like the charter rate and paying for the paying for the crew and insurance and um, fees at the ports, and so when you consider the total cost of switching to distillate fuels, uh, it may not be as as expensive as um, you might think, and certainly not as expensive as it used to be before uh, before 2020. And of course, it's easy to monetize the, the difference in the fuel costs, but what's harder to monetize are the the benefits of uh, to the environment, to the climate, uh, to the ecosystems, and to the people that live in these areas. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in. Some of them aren't phrased as questions. So I'm struggling a little bit to, to pick out some of the questions and what we can, people can read the comments that people have made. Um, but there are a couple of questions later on. One to Pam from Kate Jensen. What is the global impact of other industries than shipping just to get the full perspective? Um, is this is global I mean, again, this is a within Arctic impact. So if you're looking at global impacts from black carbon from other industries, it really depends on their location and their scale. Um, within, the, if you're talking about the impact in the Arctic, then almost all of the studies and estimates that have been done to date didn't take into account shipping because the scale was much lower. Um, as I said, because it is 
growing so quickly um, and it's delivering the black carbon so close to the snow and ice. I mean, in some cases, ships are going straight through uh, the ice pack or right along the edge of the ice pack. And it's also the case that a lot of shipping, for example, that is coming um, from north of Russia, for example, regardless of the flag, then hugs the Norwegian coastline. And then during winter, that also is covered with um, snow and ice, same along Greenland, same northern Canada. And so the amount of impact on the Arctic is potentially very great. But the big change there is that, say, in the Arctic Council, there's a big focus on things like domestic heating, which is going up slightly as some people are switching to uh, wood to um, try to save on fuel costs or because they're looking at life cycle analyses, et cetera. Uh, that may be inaccurate, again, when you take on the impact of black carbon, but the, the, my point being that those emissions are maybe going up by five, 10, 15%. And now we're looking at a source that suddenly is almost doubling in the space of five years. So it's just on a whole different scale. And given the kind of deterioration of sea ice that we're seeing, it really does not make sense to address this source because it can have such an impact on further loss of sea ice. And once that sea ice is gone, it is much more difficult actually we're finding for it to grow back in future. And then you lose the reflectivity uh, and there are a lot of global impacts because of that. So it, it really, um, should be a relatively low hanging fruit, despite the costs that, uh, that Brian just outlined to the industry. Thank you. Um, Alexander Klementiev has asked a question. I'm not gonna read it all out as time's moving on, but would like us to respond or would like a response to the comment about LNG. Brian, are you able to do that? Thank you. Uh, yep, I can take that. So I think the comment in general is that black car or LNG is a good way to uh, really dramatically reduce black carbon emissions. Um, the the issue, well, there's a couple issues, but the one issue is that the ships that are using heavy fuel oil today can't use LNG. Um, their engines aren't designed to run LNG, and they don't have the right fuel tanks on board. So their choice isn't really between switching from HFO to LNG. It's really, are you gonna use HFO with the scrubber, uh, BLSFO or MGO? Um, those are really the, the three options that you have available to you. And then the black carbon emissions, we expect to be lowest by running it on, um, on MGO. Um, and then of course, ICCT has done some research on the well-to-wake emissions of um, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions from uh, ships running LNG. And so while using LNG emits less carbon dioxide, the marine engines are tuned for low NOx emissions because NOx is a regulated pollutant um, on new engines. And as a consequence of that, the, uh, the ships and their engines are actually emitting more uh, methane in the form of methane slip because methane isn't regulated. So if you consider the methane that's escaping from the engine itself, that sabotages the overall um, climate benefits of using LNG, the potential benefits of using LNG um, from a marine fuel. Uh, so we don't really see LNG as a, a long-term climate solution for ships um, globally, and not a short-term climate solution for ships in the Arctic because of the inability to switch the fuel. Thank you, Brian. Um, Declan, your question has been answered in the chat. So I'm going to come to Oriel. I think unless anyone's got any burning questions, we've got a question from Oriel, a point from Larry, and a last question aimed at Austin. Um, unless anyone's got anything burning, I'll draw a line under that. Uh, let's move to Oriel's question first, though. Uh, black carbon seems like a problem not constrained to a given latitude. Therefore, whether IMO may accept a local ban on the Arctic, is there any research linking lower latitude emissions from shipping that can provide scientific arguments to oppose a tougher enforcement to the IMO on emissions? In the shorter term, the feeling is, is that BLSFO switch will dominate the industry. 
Brian or Pavey, would either of you like to respond to that? Or Pam, anyone? <laughs> Or should I give you a moment to think about that? And maybe Austin, would you like, uh, Pam, you're ready? Well, I mean, I, I just wanted to say that again, the, the uh, climate impact, the warming impact in the Arctic is much more clear. And that's what the research shows. Uh, you'll find in the literature, some uh, controversy about the sign at lower and middle latitudes. Um, and so it is an area of debate with, with very strong feelings on both sides. This is something the IPCC is actually looking at, but in the Arctic, there's no question whatsoever. That is not a, a, an issue that any scientist I would say really would, uh, would quibble with. Thank you. Um, Austin, a question for you. Do you feel that Arctic communities have a loud enough voice at the IMO to effectively advocate for the regulations they want to achieve, such as restrictions on black carbon emissions? Uh, quickly, no. Uh, I will say, though, that the colleagues uh, that I have here that help organize this panel have a lot more interest in, in engaging with Arctic communities than my own government. Um, my, my own government, the U.S., typically has a very poor process for engaging Arctic communities. Uh, stakeholder engagements are, are not very well advertised, uh, and they're usually never at convenient times for us in Alaska. Um, I certainly hope that changes. Uh, I certainly hope that uh, history is not a guide for how we move forward. Um, I understand uh, ICC has a petition to IMO for a consultative status, and I certainly hope that goes through. Uh, I think we need a better voice uh, at the IMO. Thank you, Austin. I think most of the rest of the, the points here are, are points rather than questions, but I'm very happy to take one last question. Or would perhaps the panelists just like to have a, a last couple of words each and then we'll wrap up, maybe, maybe responding to some of the points that are made here. We've still got an outstanding point from Chris, one from Larry that Brian I can see is responding to, and one in the chat from David who says it's not just the fuel cost itself, it's the cost of conversion of existing plants. However, the fuel cost differential is still substantial. I, I'm just going to say in terms of the fuel cost differential, it's not something I consider myself to be expert on at all, but from some um, information I saw earlier today, in fact, it suggests that the differential has reduced significantly. Um, I think it's probably from around 40% down to around 12%. Yes, it is still a cost, but the cost of alternative methods of um, removing black carbon and reducing black carbon emissions will far outweigh the costs of the fuel switch, I believe. And, and, and of course, the fuel costs are obviously always passed on to the consumer as well. And then, okay, one last question then, Brian, if you're ready and up for it. Um, a question from uh, Uni regarding the point about methane slip from LNG, is methane more critical in the Arctic than globally? Um, short answer is, uh... We haven't researched that, and so I don't have a good answer for you on that one. Yes, I'm not aware of any differential impacts of methane in, in the Arctic versus elsewhere. Obviously, the Arctic is a source. Pam, do you want to come in? Yes, but this is getting into climatology. It actually does have an enhanced impact at both poles. Uh, that is more because of what is known as polar amplification but uh, decreases in methane do decrease warming in the Arctic uh, to a greater degree than elsewhere. But that has more to do with um, uh, polar amplification as opposed to any localized impact from methane. There's no localized impact. Thank you. Right, um, I think we've picked up on most of the points that were made or most of the questions. There may be a couple of points that we didn't respond to because they were voiced as, as opinions, I think, rather than questions. I apologize if there is anything outstanding. Um, well, there's one last question come up and then I think we should wrap up. The study did take 
into consideration LPG as a bunker, or is it the same effect of LNG? Uh, LPG isn't widely used as a as a marine fuel, so we haven't looked at that. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm just going to, again, last chance, would any of the panel like to just add anything or say any final points? If not, I'm just going to, to wrap up then, please. I'm just gonna make a very few concluding remarks, not very much, um, and uh, just wrap up. Our time's up. Um, I hope we've covered most of the questions and most of the uh, comments that were made adequately. Um, if there aren't, do feel free, if we haven't, sorry, do feel free to follow up with us. Um, contact details are available or will be made available shortly. Today's presentations have, I think, hopefully highlighted the need for urgent action to reduce black carbon emissions from ships. Um, and I believe that this is action that is or should be low hanging fruit. We know how to make this happen. We don't need new technologies, new methodologies or new practices. We simply need to scale up what is already possible and what is already happening. It, I believe it can be done simply, quickly and relatively cheaply. The Arctic doesn't have another decade to wait for action to reduce black carbon emissions from any sources. Some um, scientists are talking about the complete loss of the summer sea ice by the end of this decade, and if not the end of this decade, certainly by the middle of next decade. And if we're to really be on the right side of, glo of the global climate issue, we need to take action now. And this week at the IMO, we have an opportunity to do that. As I said at the start, it's our intention to make the recording of the webinar av available and the details will be circulated to all the participants and to, to people who registered who were unable to make, uh, make the webinar at the last moment. I'd just like to take this chance to once again thank our panelists today, to Pam, Austin, Pavey and Brian, and also a big thank you to you as participants as well. I hope that everyone has, feels they've had a, an opportunity to contribute to the discussion, and I hope that uh, many of you will contribute to the discussion at PPR at the IMO this week too, and support the urgent need for strong measures, including I hope a switch to distillate or alternative cleaner fuels and methods of propulsion in order to reduce black carbon emissions from ships that impact the Arctic. Thank you and goodbye.